Hey there, everybody. How you doing? Uh, welcome to Skyther live stream for this wonderful day. Uh, it's the first of February, and I figured we got to have a stream on the first of February. Well, you just have to. Um, and I want to try and keep us to having several streams uh, a week. That's where I want to go. So we're going to keep going, and uh, with this stream tonight, we're going to do something really cool, as you saw in the title. Uh, we're going to tour our local group of galaxies, and we're going to start right here at home, as you can see, and then move on out into the universe. I have a feeling that you'll like the perspectives uh, as shown by this. Let's let's get our lights here. Let me get my lights going here. Um, so one of the things I want to do is make sure that everybody's doing fine. I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is Earth our home and uh, when we look at the earth uh, however however we view it it's beautiful um, this is of course a, a rendering that we're seeing here uh, but 
it even though it's a rendering it is just a gorgeous uh, uh, a very uh, gorgeous planet and uh, one thing about this planet which is very interesting is that it's not the most habitable world there is for us this is not a super habitable planet and that's one of the things that's a sticky wicket uh, many people think that well they, they, many people think that this this planet is perfect for us but the bottom line is it really isn't um, now there is a tremendous amount of of variation of life on this planet okay let's get our stream lights going here there we go and the life on this planet was born through evolution uh, you know born b-o-r-n-e of evolution and the evolution was based on our star and how it affected this ball that we live on right this ball of this world and so when we look at the earth and we think about its life-giving properties, one of the things we have to consider is the sheer amount of time that passed before life actually became uh, prevalent on, on this planet. It wasn't here until uh, over 2 billion years into the development of this planet. And when I say that it arrived 2 billion years into the development, I mean that that's when we started to see uh, the smallest blue-green algae and phytoplankton appear on this planet. That's when life began to uh, proliferate. And uh, it pr proliferated in the blue parts, in the water, in the oceans, because that's where, that's where life began on our planet. And it stands to reason that that's the case. Water's the great solvent. Uh, it mixes compounds. It separates compounds. It brings compounds together. It mixes atoms and molecules in trillions, literally trillions of ways. So when you look at the fact that we're made of carbon, okay, carbon is an atom that's very, very, very happy to bond with other things. In fact, it's what we call the granddaddy of all atoms. It bonds with more things than any other atom in the periodic table. So it really is our home atom. It's the, the uh, fourth most abundant element in the universe. We've talked about this before. Oxygen is the third most abundant. So carbon and oxygen have a long standing history in the universe as well as here, life on our planet. So uh, it stands to reason that we'll find life elsewhere. Where will we find it? Well, we'll find it around other stars that are kind of like our sun probably and other planets like this one. But the fact is, and what's really interesting is that when we uh, look at all the potential in our world and the universe many people don't even fully get just how many possibilities there are out there I understand the the and, and, and reiterate this myself I understand the uh, the uh, the thought process when people say I can't believe we're alone I get it I can't either in fact I know we're not alone why can I say that with such a certain certitude? Well, because I've seen things and experienced things I can't explain uh, that might be evidence of an advanced civilization that may have come here and reached us already. And that's pretty interesting. So, uh, not just that, but looking at the prospect for other worlds like this one out in the universe, I have to say that it stands to reason as well that life will have developed in the universe. This is something that's not argued by anyone in science. It used to be, but not anymore. Now, the argument is, well, could they have made it here? And that's the rub, and that's the, that's the thing I lecture about around the country right now. Um, and <clears throat> that concept uh, is one that I think at some point I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through my, my uh, presentation uh, and make that one of the streams. What would you think of that? You vote on that for me in the chat. Let me know what you think. Talk about how <clears throat> alien life could actually utilize the fundamental physics of the universe uh, to get here. Now that's a talk I can give you and, and show you all my slides and derivations and show you uh, my friend uh, Bob Schroeder's derivations as well because uh, he came up with this thought process and when I started to look at it, I reviewed it and said, wow, I think he's onto something. So uh, 
my hat's off to him. He did a, a really phenomenal uh, job thinking this one through. And he's not the only one. So suffice it to say that they could be here. And it could be that they could get here very quickly. Um, so um, despite the fact that we have a, a blue marble that we live on right here, and despite the fact that uh, we haven't found any true life elsewhere, one of the things to keep in mind is that we are actively looking, and the James Webb Space Telescope uh, recently found dimethyl sulfide in the atmosphere of a planet that's nothing like the Earth. In fact, its atmosphere is all hydrogen, the most prevalent element in the entire universe. Well, we can't breathe hydrogen, but maybe something else out there can utilize hydrogen in conjunction with something else that might be present on that planet and form some type of primitive life. The dimethyl sulfide that was found is a very interesting finding because on this high sea world, in other words, hydrogen atmosphere world that the James Webb discovered, they found a uh, signature that is made by only life as we understand it. Here on the earth, uh, we call it the smell of the sea. I've told you about this. Dimethyl sulfide is that stink that you smell when the tide goes out and you go, ugh. Boy, that smells. That's that's the the excrement, effectively waste products from phytoplankton and other sea creatures. All right, dimethyl sulfide, and as far as we know, it's only created by living things. So this, if this finding turns out to be true, then this ain't the only place where there's life, and that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Now. When we talk about other places where life can exist, yes, we there's exoplanets all within our galaxy that we can find and look at. But you know what else we want to look for? Other galaxies that might support life. And that's what tonight's about. Tonight we're going to go exploring our local group of galaxies. And we're going to see them in 3D. I've gone to a bunch of them just to make sure they're here they are. Uh, and when you go through them, it is literally uh, astonishing to t take a ride through them. And you'll actually see the scale of the universe. Uh, and we start right here on Earth. So here's our planet right here. And what it will do is move out. We're going to start moving outward. All right. And so as we back away from the Earth, okay, we see it. Oh, that's beautiful. And now if you, as you watch the Earth here, and yes, my image will be temporarily frozen from time to time. Um, okay, there's our planet vanishing into the distance and we're we're going about 5,000 kilometers per second right now and uh, now we'll accelerate to 0.07 times the speed of light there goes the moon and right, we're going to keep right on going as we move out uh you're going to see i think the sun will probably pass here as well you'll see the sun uh blaze by in a little while and uh the sun is just one star of 100 and 100 to 150 billion in our galaxy at the low end and up to 400 billion at the high end, All right? So as, as we back out now, okay, you'll start to see, okay, as the stars zip on by now, there goes our sun. That's, that's Mercury and Venus right there that just went by. There goes our sun. Now let's accelerate now. Uh, we're doing 50, uh, 53 astronomical units per second. We're going to kick it up a notch. Now we're going to go up to 0 0.027, a quarter of a light year per second. And you can start to see some of the stars are starting to move now. The closer stars to us are starting to move. We're moving out. As we back out, we're going to increase our speed to two light years per second. And yes, Alpha Centauri has already been left far behind as we've moved out here. And we're going to accelerate now to 10 light years per second. That's 11 light years per second. So as we walk, as we look around us, okay, we see the stars zipping by us. Every one of these stars could be potentially life bearing. And there is our faint Milky Way outlined right there. Remember, we're out in a spiral arm about two-thirds of the way out and as we move out of this okay 
We're going to accelerate now to 66 to 67 light years per second. I mean, that's a great, that's a phenomenal speed. Now we're going way faster than the speed of light, of course. But we're allowed to because this is just a, a ride we're taking. And we are in our Milky Way. All right. As you can see, the distances between the stars are actually quite far, aren't they? Right? And there, now, as we start to back out of our galaxy, there's the center of our galaxy. One thing to note here, um, if we look, one of the things to notice is that our, our galaxy's core is elongated. And that's because our galaxy is not just a spiral galaxy, it's a barred spiral galaxy. So it has an elongated core, and you'll notice the spiral arms are coming off of these elongated arms, or elongated core, which is really cool. Now, as we zoom out, you'll notice all these other objects out here, outside our galaxy. But wait, the stars are contained in the galaxies. So what are these? These, my friends, are all the other galaxies in the universe. Every dot you see is another galaxy. Is that not amazing? And this is actually a, uh, an accurate rendering of the universe. This particular uh, program accurately portrays the, uh, the uh, universe. You'll notice this here. This is a cluster of stars. No, galaxies. If you click on any one of these, all right, this is a galaxy, an elliptical galaxy, NGC 4339. Okay, the new general catalog one. This is another one, NGC 4486, also known as M87. M87 is a very important galaxy because it's in the Virgo cluster. And if we zoom in on this, okay, let's take a trip to it, all right? And then we'll come back and go through our local group. So we're going to center it up. And now we have to go pretty fast. So we're going to leave our Milky Way behind as we head away and head to Measure 87. Remember, Measure 87 is where we imaged that black hole for the first time in human history. All right, so we're going to make our way to it. All right. We're heading to the Virgo Cluster. Those are all galaxies going by you right now. Okay. And this is Measure 87. And the nice thing again about this program is that this program shows uh, stars like they should be shown. When we go into the galaxy, stars are point sources. And when we go into a galaxy, typically, <laughs> and now we're out of it, okay, and back to the galaxies. But when we go into a galaxy, right, what we see is that the, uh, the stars will just be point sources. They don't have, they're not blobs like we see um, in photographs. They look like they're supposed to. Individual point sources, little points of light. All right, so there's Measure 87. Now, one thing I haven't tried uh, is to see if Measure 87's black hole is in here. Uh, if it is, we're going to check it out. But we don't want to get stuck in it because we'll have to start again. There it is. Okay, we do have it. All right, we're going to go to it. We're now going to a black hole that's about six times the size of our solar system. No lie. That is a big, big object. Well, here it is. So, I don't want to be too close to this. So, we're going to back away a little bit. And if we move around... You can see the very, very powerful jets that shoot out of the north and south sides of that black hole. Now we can actually get a lot closer and let me see if we can do that without causing a tremendous ruckus here.
Of course, that material is extremely hot. Let's see if we can... I don't have much control here because the gravity is so strong. But I'm going to try and get down to where the event horizon is. If it doesn't work, we'll have to start over, but that's okay. Alright, let's just slow it down. We're going to go 2,000 AU per second. We're going to drop down to about 1,000 AU per second. Can you feel the heat? <laughs> we can see relativistic changes occurring right here. Go to the side a little bit. Holy cow. Let me just back out a little bit. There we go. Let's go this way. Slip through the disc. Notice one side is blue, that's coming toward us. The red is going away. And when we were over here, on this side, we saw the blue of the um, relativistic Doppler shifted material. There it is. Heading toward us. So this is... Uh, there's the singularity, right, uh, or the uh, event horizon in there. This is like a hot... Uh, this, the black holes are extremely hot, so they have all this tremendous energy they're, that they're... Uh, they're constantly boiling off at their event horizons. Let's see if we can get in here. I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Let's try. Let's try this. Okay, turn down the volume because we're going in here. All right, let's go slow. There we are. Interesting, this is probably one of the most crazy places you'd ever want to be in the entire universe is here. The entrance to a black hole. And that's as close as I want to get because I don't want to mess up our trip. So I'm going to pull out of that and make our way out of Measure 87's core. Oof, we survived. Not bad. All right, and there we are out of Mesh 87. Now, what I want to do uh, is show you, I want to take us back to uh, the Milky Way, and we'll go back via a globular cluster. So, we're going to turn around, leave this behind, head the 55 million light years back to our galaxy in a split second. And this is a, this globular cluster. This is Measure 92. It's NGC 6341. And what I want to do is take you through this. All right. So you get to see the black hole at the center of Measure 87, which is similar to the black hole at the center of ours. And now as we go through a globular cluster, you'll see that it's very interesting. If you were in this globular cluster, uh, you would end up literally having this many stars all around you and to you it wouldn't be any big deal you'd have a, a just a, a incredibly bright sky all around you so this is what it would look like for you inside a globular cluster there's our galaxy you would have all these many many bright stars 
in the galaxy with you, right? And then a faint band that's the Milky Way running there the, with the center of the Milky Way right there. So the Milky Way would be gigantic in your sky. It'd be massive in your sky. Isn't that crazy? So, <clears throat> uh, and Genghis says spaghettification. Uh, I do want to take a moment to say hi to everybody. I want to say hi to Michael uh, Tar Calabos. James Hyatt, good to see you, brother. Michael Galea is with us. Nice to see you as well. And I know that uh, I have seen Trisha Ferrer in here before. Hello, Trisha. Tim F. Eric's Automotive. What's all going on, guys? Genghis. And uh, Daisy and Zoe Amethyst are with us as well. Nice to see you. And Lubo in China. Hi. Lubo, we're doing a tour of the local group of galaxies. And it's starting with a, uh, a fly-through of this globular cluster that we just did. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. There we go. So once we get through there and we look at our galaxy, you can see there's a lot of detail in the galaxy. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is to begin our tour, we're going to go to, of course, the one everybody uh, thinks of first, the Andromeda Galaxy, Measure 31. So what we're going to do is, first of all, just see where it is. So let's check it out. We're rotating away from the center of our galaxy, still looking through many stars in our galaxy. However, now we get to see this guy in our sky, and that's about how big it looks in our sky. And now what we'll do is go there. All right, so we're leaving our galaxy behind. So it's centered up, and if we look around, we'll see our galaxy being left behind. There it is. And those are all galaxies out there. And then we have this. Now, this, again, it's an accurate rendering. So when we look at it, as we close in, you know what this is. This guy right here, all right, if we slow us down and grab it. Let me uh, just spin us around here. There it is. Okay, that guy right there. I can't get it yet. <laughs> we'll start with this one then. All right, this one. That's Galaxy Measure 110, which we often do visualize and show. All right, we can actually fly to it. That's Measure 110. Neat. And then uh, this is Measure 32 down here. This guy is Measure 32 right there. Also known as NGC 221. And these are two of the Andromeda Companion Galaxies. Now, our local group are the local group of galaxies that uh, basically are within our gravitationally bound collective of galaxies that are moving together around the center of the universe, around the center of the galaxy. Uh, the, sorry, around uh, a, a toward a common center in the universe, which is uh, the great attractor that those that uh, our group of galaxies, the local group, are doing that, moving in that direction. Hey, Batty. Uh, Batty says, just watch the documentary on Andromeda. Fascinating stuff. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. If you're just joining us, uh, do subscribe to Sky Tour live stream. Um, and uh, Skyther Livestream is our remote observatory that we run on uh, nights that are, let's see if this is, um, let's see if I got it here, just a sec. Yeah, this is it. Uh, Skyther Livestream, we operate on clear nights, and uh, it's really uh, very enjoyable. People uh, really enjoy it, and they... Uh, they say that uh, they they have spent a lot of time with us. They they check out everything that we do. They love what we do, and uh, I encourage you to join us. So skytourlive.org. 
Here's where you'll find us. All right. That's Roy Batty. <laughs> so here we are at Andromeda. And uh, what's interesting here is that from this perspective, that's not what we see when we see Measure um, 110 and Measure 32. Okay, we don't see it this way because our perspective is a little different. See, because we're like rotating around the center of the Andromeda galaxy, so we don't see it the same way. Remember, it's a three dimensional universe. In fact, Measure 110 is closer to us than Measure 32. If you look, you'll see that Andromeda is next after Measure 110. And then Measure 32 is way out there. But they're satellites. They go around each other. They're all gravitationally bound. And then they're all bound to our local group. Every dot in the background, by the way, as I mentioned, these are galaxies. Okay, There is our Milky Way right here that we're seeing. All right, that's the Milky Way. And that's uh, 2.5 uh, million light years away. All right, But sharing the space here is another galaxy in our local group uh, with us besides Andromeda. Um, and while we're here, I'll just show you as we approach Andromeda that this really is a three-dimensional uh, galaxy, right? So as we uh, make our way into it, all right, you'll be able to see, let's uh, level things out here, leave the, our Milky Way in the background there. Let's drop in. It's a big collection of stars, and you'll start to see stars coming at us here very soon. Here they come. And we're now we're heading toward the core of the Andromeda galaxy and then out of the core. And then out past the fringes and over to Measure 110. And as we approach Measure 110, okay, you'll see that the stars are left behind. And then what we see around us are only the galaxies, which will come into view here very soon. And there's our Milky Way down there. So there's Measure 110. Right through. And now we have the galaxies back again. And as we wait, uh, to turn around here, one of the galaxies that we want to see, in fact, and go to, is Measure 33. So that is the Triangulum Galaxy, and that is coming up here in a, just a second. I want that guy, and Measure, oops, I made a mistake, Measure 33. That guy, there we go. So as we turn around, all right, come back through the Andromeda galaxy, and a companion to it in space is this guy. And it's possible that these two have interacted with each other in the past, and that could explain a lot of what's going on in Measure 33 right now. Uh, this Measure 31 here, Measure 31 is a massive galaxy. It's got over a trillion stars in it. And uh, Triangulum has way less than that. And it's actually a, a galaxy that's got a lot of really interesting features in its own right. And as we approach it, you'll see some of them because this uh, program faithfully reproduces them. Um, and everything is in the right amounts. That's what I like about this program. So in a sense, sometimes it's kind of boring because it's, it's showing it to you as it is and not as we'd like it to be, like a pretty thing. Okay. But this is um, this is the, the galaxy. Um, and I'm going to rotate around uh, because I'm going to put this in the 
orientation that we're used to seeing. All right, and it's not almost there. That's right here. Okay, and then we have to move up a little bit and look down on it. So we're used to seeing it kind of like this, as you may remember. Measure 33, and we have this big, beautiful nebula right here, known as NGC 604. And NGC 604, whoops, that's a galaxy in the background, uh, is a amazing uh, location, which is a uh, H2 region. It's a H alpha region that's emitting a red light. It's it's a very very hot star forming region, stellar nursery, and. This particular galaxy is replete with them. There are many, many well-known uh, areas in this galaxy that are, uh, in fact, just that. They're just absolutely outrageous. So one, thing's, one thing we can do uh, is to just start to move around it here a little bit. And you'll see the spiral arms are really very loosely wound aren't they uh, and they're loosely wound because um, they're, they're loosely wound because of the fact that uh, this galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy may have interacted but that's not the only reason galaxies have loose arms uh, sometimes they interact with others now isn't it interesting how the galaxies almost look translucent here and you can see the other ones behind them uh, that's how it is if you're out in space, the stars are all, uh, these are stars, but they're discrete points of light, okay? They're not big walls of gas. They're discrete wall, uh, discrete balls of light. So if we come in, all right, and just start moving in here, all right, and take a lot, take a look through here. I know what you asked here, Lubo, hang on. Um, and if we start to go through, as we approach, you're going to see that we're going to start to see these are individual stars. Right? Now, watch what happens as we get closer. You're going to see more and more stars showing up. Yeah. And it's these stars which are making up those clouds you're seeing from a long distance. Billions of them. So, this is... This is what we see when we go into these galaxies, right? Now, I want to just take us for a little trip uh, through this dust. These dust lanes we image all the time. Uh, and this galaxy has its own share of nebulae. Okay, we're coming up on one right now. Not sure if that's a named one or if it's just a generated one. Yeah, it's a generated one. But many of these things that we see in the telescope are uh, actual objects that we actually see in the in the uh, SkyTour Livestream telescopes. Now, if we just come right back out of here and just move out of the way. There we go. There we are. We're out of measure 33 right now. And you might wonder, are they really that flat? Well, yeah, actually they are. Um, because they have a central bulge, right? And then they have a nucleus. Uh, sorry, then they have a uh, spiral arms, which are outside the bulge. So let's stop right here, put the brakes on and take a dive straight down and make measure 33 in an edge, edge on galaxy. And you can see that right there. Here's our, our spiral arms from the edge. So when we see an edge on galaxy like NGC 4565 or one of the other ones that we've looked at, well, you're seeing that because the spiral arms are seen edge on. That's why it looks this way. So, uh, so you know that we've seen that, and as we get closer, we start to see these objects.
And this galaxy, of course, has many known globular clusters uh, as well. And if we go traveling through here, you are bound to find one or two. But I don't expect that we will right now. Oh, look, it even has a little dark nebula right here. What's that? Oh, look at that. It's a, it's a diffuse nebula. How about that? So there you go. So that's this galaxy. So Andromeda, Mesher 33. And again, these are all galaxies out here. All galaxies. And now, uh, as far as what comes next, well, we have in our local group of galaxies, we've got uh, NGC 147. And what is NGC 147? Well, NGC 147 is over here. <laughs> and it doesn't look like much. We look at this right here. What's this? This is the Andromeda galaxy, right? And back here, Mesher 33. And then up there, all right, we have NGC 47, uh, 147. And let's go there and see what we're looking at. So we'll leave Andromeda and Mesher 33 uh, alone for a while. And we're going to go... We're 394,000 light years from it right now. 370. And closing in. And now we're only going to be 26,000 light years away. And this is uh, kind of like uh, the distance of globular, uh, uh, globular clusters from the center. Uh, I'm sorry, from our Earth. They'll generally be maybe 25,000 uh, light years away on average, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty cool how it works. So let's uh, let's go back here, and this galaxy is known as an elliptical galaxy. All right, it's slightly elongated. They're well known for not having a whole lot of gas in them, but they'll have some bright stars. But they'll have a bunch of rich small stars in there as well. I say small stars, meaning low mass stars. But there we go. That's one of the galaxies in our local group. Neat stuff. It's amazing because you're seeing when you look. If we uh, stop here uh, for a moment and just take a, a look around. Okay. Right here. Okay, that is the Triangulum Galaxy. This one is local to it. It's local to Andromeda. It's local to us. Yet, there, there are so many light years away. Tens of thousands of light years. Millions of light years away from each other. Okay, our, our galaxy is 2.7 million light years from the Triangulum Galaxy. 2.5 light, million light years from Andromeda. It's really impressive. But then you look at all these galaxies that are out in the universe and when you look at this one of the things that you, you have to think about okay one of the things that i always think about is that as as the universe is going by us here every one of those dots is a galaxy every one of those dots has perhaps a hundred billion minimum minimally stars possibly a trillion stars each and these are the galaxies we can see in the observable universe. There's a whole lot more we can't see in the unobserved universe. So what do I mean by observable, observable universe and unobservable universe? Well, it comes down to this. When you're looking at the universe, you see the light that has reached us from as far away as the universe is and we were born four and a half billion years ago here on this planet all right 
The universe is 13.8 billion years old. So we see light from the time that's about 13.5 billion years old. And we see that light 13.5, 13.6 billion years ago. Not quite 13.8, because uh, we have the uh, cosmic microwave background, which sort of is the the uh, leftover remnant of the Big Bang. And that leftover remnant occurred after the birth of the universe. So we can't see back to the beginning. Because the universe was opaque before it became clear. It was opaque because there weren't atoms, there were particles. And they were whirring around each other. Plasma, hot plasma, which is opaque. You can't see through the sun. It's a bunch of plasma. But as it cooled, um, electrons could combine with protons. And that cleared the universe uh, once these particles began to bind up with each other. And by binding up with each other, we ended up being able to see the universe become more and more transparent. So... When we looked out into the universe, we could see to a certain distance, it's about 13.5, 13.6 billion years in the past, to the cosmic microwave background, but not beyond, and we never will. However, if you think, if we're seeing light from 13.5 or 6 billion years ago, isn't that the big, isn't that the size of the universe? That's what you might think. Right? 13.5 billion light years. That's how big the universe would be, right? Or if we know its age is 13.8, it's 13.8 billion light years that we can kind of see out past the cosmic microwave background. But the truth is, that's not how big it is. And there's light coming from parts of the universe that has never reached us. And that's because... The light that took 13.8 billion years to get to us, during that time, the universe was still expanding and accelerating in its expansion. So the outer reaches of the universe are now way beyond. Uh, the only light that reached us is, is light from 13.8, 13.5 or 6 billion years ago. The light after that, that's being emanated from the objects now, we will never see. So when we look and we see about 2 trillion other galaxies in this view, and it's true, 2 trillion other galaxies, when we see those galaxies, one of the things to keep in mind is that this isn't all there is. There's a lot more that we haven't seen. Now the James Webb Telescope can see uh, galaxies whose light has been shifted into the red so far that they're not visible in the visible spectrum at all. And that comes with what's called galactic or cosmological redshift. As things move away, they actually, um, uh, their light gets redder and they start moving faster. And the faster they go, the more their light shifts. And the more their light shifts, uh, the more we'll find that it's, it's, uh, it's moving into the deep red, like me, see? And eventually, it'll reach the infrared. And then after that, it'll go into the far infrared. And the far infrared is, again, a place that's just, you know, invisible to us. We can't see it. So, that said, um, I think what we'll do is... Uh, We've gone to some of these dwarf galaxies. There's a whole bunch more of them, but they look pretty much the same. Um, one that I think might be cool to look at, and it's not really a member of our local group, but it's one that you'll recognize. And it's one I've talked about many times with a specific feature to it. It's Measure 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Let's go to that one. All right. Yes, we have a massive, capable ship, and let's put this uh, let's put this in the uh, orientation that we're familiar with. Oops, sorry. All right, let's go back. There we go. All right, so this is the orientation we're familiar with. Now. Um, 
This means that either the Milky Way is going to be straight through or behind us. Let's find out. Let's say F3. And we can just say, you know, grab something in the Milky Way. Just say, okay, where is it? Okay, so it's going to be behind us. All right, so our Milky Way is way out there. Okay, so this galaxy here is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Okay, so we're seeing it uh, as we see it from the Earth. Okay, I have the Earth, the, the, the galaxy is behind us. So looking at this galaxy, we see it as a two-dimensional projection on, our, on a plane, don't we? We don't actually get to see it like it really is. And I've mentioned to you before that this galaxy here is a satellite that collided with this galaxy. And as it went through, it pulled on the galaxy, right? And pulled the spiral arm and that this was at a different level, right? Than this galaxy. I mentioned that many times. So as we rotate this around, Okay, you can see that this galaxy is further in than the nucleus of this galaxy. This is here, and then you gotta go down to that one. And what that means is that this galaxy's spiral arms are warped. And that warp actually, uh, let me just level this out so you can see that a little better. So these galaxies' arms are warped down to this uh this little perpetrator here and this galaxy has gone through it all right and if we saw this from this side it would be two galaxies next to each other and if we saw it like this we'd say what the heck's going on here this is some strange hybrid galaxy somewhere in the galaxy someone is looking at this this whirlpool and you know somewhere in a galaxy they're seeing the whirlpool like this and that's pretty crazy you know, so that's interesting how this uh, the galaxy again being in 3D is uh, what causes that. And of course, this image of the whirlpool is a uh, part of the one of the some of the latest imagery that's come in. They've done a very nice job with this. Okay, so now here's another thing too. This galaxy's spiral arms. The rumor, <laughs> if you call it that, in the rumor mill or in the uh, world of cosmology and galactic structure, the rumor is that this galaxy's spiral arms actually were in part caused by the collision with this galaxy. That's pretty cool, if true. All right. And of course, we'll take a little trip down through this galaxy. Wow. Neato. And then we have another galaxy down here, you'll notice. So we're going to head down there. And you'll see that the stars don't stop. They get denser as we get toward this galaxy. So then, as we pull out of this one, and they go away, we'll eventually return to intergalactic space. And we'll end up seeing just galaxies again. And that's exactly where we are now. Pull out a little more. On this side of the whirlpool. And now we have galaxies everywhere we look. Absolutely incredible. So here's another one. This one here is in what's called an irregular galaxy. NGC 4618. We'll say goodbye to the whirlpool for now. And we'll come over here and look at this irregular galaxy. 
Obviously, irregulars are called this because they are somewhat irregular in shape. And this one is irregular in shape. And what for? No one knows. We don't really know what has caused them to be irregular in their in shape like this, but uh, they have been. All right, let's let's go around this. You see how the dust is not in any specific arrangement, like in a spiral arm structure. It's 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 just sort of haphazard. Most likely what happened in this galaxy is that it was uh, it was uh, sucked into or spit out of another galaxy after some type of collision. Remember, the universe has been here for 13.8 billion years. So a lot could happen. And a lot has. Nice. And then out here we have more galaxies. You see these? Yep, these are neat galaxies out here. That's the whirlpool. We were just there. And now we're going to go here. This is Measure 101. This galaxy is in Ursa Major. Although not a member of our local group, uh, this galaxy is interesting because, if you recall, we went to Measure 101 and looked at a supernova in Measure 101. And I can show you kind of where that was. Let's do this. I'm going to take a trip up top here. They all look the same from the edge, don't they? Right? All right, so now we move into M101, another big spiral galaxy. And I'm going to move us over. Okay. And I have to take us over to this side and put it in the orientation that we are familiar with. And I think this is getting closer. Somewhat close, a little bit. I think I gotta spin it more this way. And then, if you notice, if you remember, when we looked here, there was this clump of stars and there was a supernova that occurred right here. And that supernova was right at this spot in the galaxy, just about. And we were able to image it, if you recall. It was really uh, quite a wonderful set of nights we actually imaged this supernova there. And it stayed there for a couple months. But this is Measure 101. <clears throat> now, I mentioned NGC 4565, and although not a member of the local group, I'm going to uh, go there anyway because I'd like you to see uh, how it looks in this particular rendering. So we'll just move it over. I like doing this so you can see where it is relative to this. You can see the shape of that galaxy right there. See it? But we're going to say go. And we're going to leave the pinwheel galaxy behind. And move our way through. Pardon me. Pardon me. Out into intergalactic space. Everything's a galaxy you see here. Wham. And now... All right, and the engines are shut off now, and we can start to use our little side thrusters. So, from above, 
the suspicion is that this galaxy will look kind of like this. Now this is kind of what we expect a, a galaxy like that to look like because we're seeing it from the edge, remember? So we're seeing those beautiful dark lanes from the edge and together they just make this line through the middle, which is what we see. But this is what we expect the NGC 4565 looks like from here. That's pretty incredible. And then we'll do something that we could just never do um, with NGC 4565, and that's fly through it. Let's fly through this arm. Bring ourselves through. You'll see the stars showing up momentarily to make up all those many star clouds you're looking at. Young blue stars dominate the disk of the galaxy. Older yellow stars dominate the center of the galaxy. And you can see from here, there's plenty of them. And then through the dust, you can get carried away in here. Yeah, you can. <laughs> and then go plunging back through. Uh, plaf. <laughs> and then back up. So the galaxy then, again, they're vast, vast island universes of stars. And in many ways, um, it, takes, it takes quite a bit of effort to really grasp that all of these things you're looking at, all these potential stars could be uh, suns that could house and foster life. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. And although I am driving this program, I'll take your question, Michael Hedrick. What'd you ask? I don't like this. Uh, 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 do you ever, do I still use camera film ever? It's making a comeback. Uh, yes, actually. Um, my son uh, has a website called shootretro.com. And he, um, he was a film student, now works for the biggest television station in the state of Connecticut, uh, doing very well. And he's all over the state every single night. And uh, that's where he is now. Uh, but um, he has a site that you should check out called ShootRetro.com. ShootRetro.com. And on ShootRetro.com, he reviews actual film. And he buys film from all over the world. Shoots it through old cameras that he's also purchased. And then does a review of how it works and how it looks. So it is making a comeback, especially for him. You know? So this is this is cool. So yeah, give that a shot. Shootretro.com. So we're in Galaxy NGC 4565. And we are just zipping through. Uh, we can do actual massive shifts if we want to. Or go back in to the disk. But NGC 4565 is stunning to us in our telescope. And remember what we see when we see it. Right? 
we actually end up seeing a galaxy that looks more like this. Okay, and just a little bit on edge, kind of like this. Like that. That's 4565. That's our view. But tonight you got a chance to go flying through the turbulent eddies and backwaters of NGC 4565. So next time you look at it, you'll say, I was there. <laughs> Pretty cool. Now, um, another set of galaxies that are not in our local group, M81 and M82. And um, these galaxies are, again, a pair of galaxies that may have actually interacted with each other in the past. All right, so we're going to go there now. This is BM81. Uh, as we get there, you'll see M82 as well because they're in the same region of space. Okay, so you'll see M82 showing up as well as we close in. There it is. Yeah, and this guy over here. That's a different galaxy. And we have a, this is a little dwarf galaxy. We actually, we've actually, you, if we, we shot M81 uh, before, we've seen this little tiny galaxy. Uh, and you have too, we've shot that. And this galaxy over here shows M82? No, that's not M82. Is that M82? That's not M82. Well, Actually, it could be, from this perspective, we might be... Oh yeah, you know what? I'm not thinking. This is a starburst galaxy, that's correct. But you'll notice that its orientation relative to M81 is this, right? That's not what M81 looks like to us. What M81 looks like to us is more like this. Remember? What a beautiful galaxy it is. And it's actually more even like this. Maybe on a little angle. And then when we look up from it, uh, well, I'll, I'll find it. I'll look. But there's M81, all right? And if we look for M82, All right, it's down here, okay. Okay, so M82 is just a little bit on a different angle to us. It's more of on, on edge. But they see how close they are in space? Now, the rumor is that M82 and M81 have interacted with each other, and the interaction may have caused the starburst that we see, the starburst formation that we see here. Um, so if we go to M82, okay, now you, you'll see this is the starburst uh, in M82 that we're talking about. And as we make our way around the galaxy, it'll look familiar to you. Okay, this is what M82 looks like to us. That's more of what we see, all right? But again, it's in three dimensions. So because it's in three dimensions, um, I, I, don't, I don't think that we would expect to see um, exactly as we see it from the Earth. So that's what we see from the Earth, is like that. Okay, now the red goes away in the interest of uh, distance and calculating. But this is what we see from Earth, right? It's more like this, which is really fascinating. Okay, so this galaxy and this one have interacted with each other, which is fascinating to me. Um, oh, Michael Hedrick uh, says, uh, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, okay. Oh, even the caps are for questions, but that's okay. I knew you wanted to yell something out. That's good. <laughs> that's fine. Hey, Donald Kunzer, how are you? Good to see you. And MPG's with us. 
Nice to see you. Yeah. So I, I'm, uh, I'm showing you uh, galaxies that are in our local group and those that are not. Um, and the ones that are in our local group, uh, many of them are small dwarf galaxies. Um, uh, give you an example. Uh, let's go. Well, first of all, let me just show you. Let's go one more time to M82 and take a ride through M82 while we're here. I mean, hey, come on. You took the trip. You might as well go. You, you know, you might as well take a ride through it for crying out loud. Jeez. Some artifacts of the graphics there, but look at that. All right, so what's going on here? This red is uh, a lot of ionized hydrogen gas. And it's blasting up through the north pole of this galaxy and through the south. Can you imagine being in this galaxy? Wow. So this is where you are. Okay, this is our home. Now, out this way, you'd see nothing. Globular cluster or two out there, cluster. But then you'd see this massive, giant red cloud everywhere you look that rivals your Milky Way if we lived in here. Isn't this crazy? Yeah, that's, pr that's just beautiful. Yeah, wow. Yep, and if we uh, pick a star, okay. this is an F5.75. There's, this star could have planets around it. Um, the space engine simulates having planets around things, even though we don't know whether there are. Roy Betty asked if Andromeda uh, ate most or any of its uh, uh, companions, neighbor galaxies. Um, it doesn't show signs that it has. You know, okay, so here is this star. And you'll notice that there is a star here, and it's actually got an F5.75 and an F uh, or a K1.65. Uh, and they, they like to show that there's a couple planets as well, okay? And... They don't know this for sure, obviously. And that these are just suppositions. You know. However, it is kind of interesting to uh, see this kind of thing and and they like to show this a lot with Space Engine. Alright. Wow. And there's a globular the cluster. Yep. There's a the nice globular. Notice how the program, if there's a star that comes in that's really bright, its glare will cover everything else. I think that's actually very realistic. You can adjust that so it doesn't do that, but... As soon as it leaves, it comes back. It's actually kind of cool. So M82 has its own interesting uh, potential, um, I guess, characteristics that life forms in that region would really find to be normal for them and we'd find it to be exotic. Seeing all this beautiful gas in your galaxy would be normal for you. Jeez, that's incredible. Yes, it is. Wow. Okay. All right. So now let's see. Um, uh, we can probably go.
while we're here, we can go to the middle of measure 82 and go to its black hole. Oh boy. Wow, we went through it. <laughs> Not through the black hole, but we went through the uh we went we went and orbited the singularity or the uh event horizon. Pretty cool. I promise it'd be a lot more violent if we were actually there. MPG asks if we've gone to Trappist 1. Uh, no, we haven't. Would you like to? I think we can do that. We were doing galaxies tonight, but there's no reason we can't take a side journey. It's going to take us approximately... Uh, probably 52 million years to get back to Earth, so you just stick with me. <laughs> All right, let's see here. So we're going up through the plumes of starburst energy that, um, and uh, hydrogen gas that's in the galaxy. Nice. Very nice. That's looking pretty, I'm telling you. That really is pretty. See, that's what I like about this program. It, it's actually realistic. It's realistically showing you things. Well, it's also showing you, you know, planets that really aren't there and stuff like that. But if you think about it, um, it's showing you the real stuff too, you know? So uh, let's actually now go back to our Milky Way and we'll take care of the requested object. Because I would like to go there. I don't know that I've ever... There we go. See, we actually just hyper, hyper-speeded. Okay, these are the Magellanic Clouds, by the way. These are our companion galaxies. And we have a dwarf galaxy that's attached to us as well. All right? But the Magellanic Clouds are our companions to us as well. Um, but while we're here, uh, let's look up TRAPPIST-1. Here it is. Also known as two mass uh, J twenty three zero six two. So we're gonna see where that is. That's here. It is in our galaxy. There it is. See the little crosshairs. Now, could we navigate to it directly? Sure, we can. But boy, oh boy, that would take a long time because we have to start slowing down long before we get there. But we're now gonna zoom in really fast into this particular section of the galaxy and then we'll get it right moved into the star there's trappist one the star All right and if we look we see that there's a bunch of planets here interesting about these planets uh e uh e f and g are the most likely habitable planets but most likely F, okay? F is most likely the, the habitable one. This is an M-type star. It's a flare star. Um, and so the chances of there being uh, life are somewhat diminished by that, but not necessarily diminished. Okay, so here we see there's, there's that one. This one, okay, this is going to be D, right? And E is going to be further up. And then F. What's interesting about F, and we'll show you. We go to F. Now, this program doesn't show uh, real, you know, the realistic view of what G looks like because we don't know what G looks like. So it, it just presupposes a standard, uh, a standard rocky planet. All right. 
but that doesn't mean that that's what's really there. In fact, um, it's it's likely that it, it may have an atmosphere of some kind. And having an atmosphere, okay, uh, means that you're going to end up with a planet that could have a magnetic field. And if it has a magnetic field, well, then you might get auroras, aurora borealis. And, and here we actually see the auroral oval on this planet, uh, trappist one F. All right, so let's uh, let's actually let's uh, slow down here a little. So you see, there's an atmosphere, but we don't know if it's real. If that's a real atmosphere, we don't know if it has any yet. Uh, after the James Webb looks at this uh, planet, it may be able to characterize the atmosphere it may have, which is kind of cool. So the auroras and what they may look like is just a supposition. But hey, it's just beautiful no matter what, isn't it? Kind of looks like the barrier at the edge of the universe with Star Trek, the original series. <laughs> kind of cool. All right. Now, uh, Trappist G, the next one out, is another one that could possibly uh, boast some life. Um, and Trappist G, uh, all of these are... Uh, Every single one of these planets, as far away as they look like they are from their star, okay? See, the star is to the upper right, right? As far away as these look from their star, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that as far as, away, as far away as they look, they're actually all, all of them are within the orbit of Mercury around their star. They're all within the orbit of Mercury, all right? So there is our st our star that we're looking at. You can see it has an auroral oval as well. An atmosphere given away by the ring around the edge, which is what you'd get from an atmosphere. And what color is the ring at the edges? It's red. Why? Well, not only because the star is red, but because the atmosphere is probably scattering the blue light like we see leaving only the red, which is why satellites, when they're in orbit over our planet, as they start to fade out, they actually start to turn yellowish red because they see sunset from their perspective. So let me tell you, that's pretty cool. I've been trying to pay attention to the chat. Oh, Marianne's here. Hey, Marianne. Nice to see you. Stephen Ireland, how are you? Really nice to see you. Uh, would you be able to see the red dust? I know that you left that message earlier, Stephen, but um, for which, for what were you talking about? The red dust around what? Let me know. Okay, MPG says. Okay, we did the we did Trappist one. We're there now. We're at Trappist. G, as you can see here. Trappist H. Actually, let's let's first go to Trappist B. Okay, the closest one to the star. So we're going to head over there. There's Trappist B. All right. Every one of these planets are closer to the star in their orbits than Mercury is to our sun. All right. And every one of these planets is going to be tidally locked, meaning one face is going to face the star the whole time. And that means you're going to have an extremely hot side and then you're going to have a perpetual sunset side and sunrise side, if you will. And then on the back side, you're going to have a perpetual uh, star, star sky. But because they only orbit in just like a few, few days, then the entire year, the entire year will be... Uh, passing in just a few days 
it takes us 365 days. Um, and if you were going to uh, Trappist G, H, or B, well, try it. Let's go F, G, and H. Uh, then you'd have a few days for your year. So the stars, if you went on the night side, if you went to have a vacation on the night side, you'd have stars 24-7, if you want to say it that way, because um, there's no concept of a day on the Trappist system. Um, and so you'd have stars the entire time that you were there. If you went to the sunset or sunrise side, you'd have the sunset all the time. So photographers who like sunsets, this is your place to go. This is your place to go. And then, if you like beaches, well then, uh, this is your place to go if you want beaches because uh, this sunrise side here, this sunny side, out here, uh, it's pretty hot out here. It's going to be uh, massively hot out here. But if you look at the, say, Trappist F, G, or H, probably E, F, and G, um, E is the equivalent in terms of heating. E is the equivalent of where Venus would have been to our sun. Okay, F is the equivalent of sort of where Earth would have been. And G is kind of Mars, if you think of it that way. So E would be a little too hot for us. G would be a little too cold. But F would be more or less the best candidate. So if F is actually found to have a reasonable atmosphere, we can expect to find life. But how would you? How would life have developed on a star like this and on a planet like this? Because when you look at a planet like this, as I said, it's tidally locked. So this side is always facing the sun. So this side is going to end up drier and hotter than the the other side so what ends up happening in our estimation is that this hot side will be dry and arid and the atmosphere will be really really warm but because the atmosphere goes around the whole planet it will move through weather systems to the other side of the planet and possibly do so with some violence because this hot air is never allowed to cool until it gets to the other side. And so you have uh, the colder side on this one and the hotter side here. And with the way the atmosphere heats up and the currents move within the atmosphere, it could mean that at this sunset terminator border, these could just be winds moving, very, very high winds moving across from one side to the other. But the benefit is that the warm temperatures from this side would mix onto the cool side. And that means that E over here, all right, if we go to E, all right, there it is right there. All these planets are within sight of each other. But we go to E, and now, again, I said yes, that was, it would be the Venus-type planet for this solar system, this star system. But if we went here, that means that because the uh, atmosphere is mixing across the Terminator, the hot air whipping across here into the dark side, this planet, which could be uh, too uh, hot on this side, might be perfect in the dark for life. All right? Now, stay with me. If it's perfect for life in the dark, what would you as a being look like in the dark, you wouldn't need color, right? In the dark, if you had eyes, you'd want to see, so your eyes would probably be bigger, right? But your star, excuse me, your star is also a, a, a red dwarf, and it's a flare star. So your eyes would probably develop a covering to protect you from ultraviolet radiation that makes its way down through the poles of the magnetic field on your planet and uh, potentially strikes the surface. Uh, less on this side, more on this side. But most likely you don't just stay in the dark, you, you will come to the Terminator, maybe make a venture to this side as well. So what would you look like? Well, you'd, you might be kind of grayish in appearance. You might have larger black eyes, 
so that you can protect yourself from the UV and actually see better in the dark. And the creatures that we see that we call the greys, okay, that are reported often, could very well be the creatures that live in this perpetual darkness on a star that's a red dwarf where the planet was tidally locked. Um, so it, it's a very good possibility. Michael Hedrick has a question. Did you say that we determined that there are identified exoplanets with aurora? Or was that hypothetical? Oh, yeah. Um, very interesting. There is uh, There was a finding that indicated a possibility that uh, during a transit, they might have seen an auroral signature indicating that a planet had an atmosphere. Um, now, an aurora is an emission, okay? It's an e emission, emitting of light. So it would actually be an emission line in a star's spectrum that maybe didn't belong there. And we'd see it when the star and the planet were just, when the planet was just starting to cross in front of the star. Okay, that's called ingress. And as soon as the planet starts to cross in front of the star, that very, very edge of the planet's atmosphere hits the star first. And when that happens, that data becomes very important because then we can see what the atmosphere is made of right then and there. And then on the way out, the same thing. So uh, that would actually tell us an awful lot. And uh, the, I think we, we may have actually caught a uh, auroral signature from a planet that is actually, uh, you know, with an atmosphere that that was actually a uh, something that I saw um, so um, as Marianne says if you like what we do uh, and you want to contribute more you could join STLS or the you know join it just subscribe to us anyway it's free you know if you want to join our patreon man we'd love it we'd love to have you guys with us um, because we really love what we do, and we'd like to have uh, the ability to continue this. We, uh, uh, thanks to some donors, we have uh, the ability to buy another telescope, which we're getting, and I'll be out there in the coming month. Actually, this is the coming month, uh, near the end of this month, and I'm going to uh, scout a new site and see if it's uh, worth putting a telescope in. I have to do a sky survey there and see what we got for horizons, what we've got for light pollution. Um, and many places out there, it's really remote. Um, and I've got lots of people offering to let us put stuff on their property, which is nice. Um, so um, the other thing too I want to mention is if you want to contribute more, we do have a Patreon and we are looking uh, for more people to join us. Um, you know, I I think that the, when we get more people, that'll allow us to pay for the internet uh, that we need to uh, pay for. Because our internet that we pay for is all Starlink. Uh, and Calibos knows it well because Calibos works for SpaceX. And um, I also want to mention too, with the same breath as Calibos and Tiffany, uh, Calibos and Tiffany are a a pair. They're joined at the hip, uh, but but don't don't make fun of them when you see them. Okay, they're they're connected, you know. But uh, <laughs> Calibos and Tiffany are uh, official volunteers for Skyto live stream, and they've selected our modest little stream uh, to be the focal point and giveaway point for telescope binocular and some night vision equipment and um, we're honored to have them as volunteers we're honored to have them on board with us and I just want to publicly thank them uh, Calibos was gonna join me tonight uh, uh, because it was sort of like last minute we didn't get to work it out but in the next stream we'll probably have him on so uh, that said um, you can join us because uh, you never know on, on our streams we do have these spontaneous equipment giveaways we've already given away a telescope two pairs of binoculars uh, and that's not the end of it we're going to keep doing it uh, so I hope that you guys uh, take the time to uh, subscribe to us and like I said <clears throat> I have Patreon levels that are for everybody's budget um, 
you know, for less than a stahit. How am I feel like a I feel like an NPR freaking telephone, you know, for less than a cup of coffee, uh, you can support and yeah, 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 you, you get the idea. <clears throat> but uh, join us. We love it. We'd love to have you with us. Um, our SkyTour family has been growing and growing. And the people that are here are the people that really want to be here. Uh, and I will say we've, we've actually removed some people that they weren't taking it you know the way we want they weren't they were actually using it as a platform for other things and that's not what it is i'm a science guy and i fought the arrogance of science for years i'm also someone who firmly believes in extraterrestrial presence on the earth um, and not because i'm a lunatic with a tinfoil hat not at all um but it's because of the fact that uh i've had experiences i can't explain and my science can't explain them so, on occasion, I will wear these glasses, all right? But, I will tell you that jokes aside, I do think they're here. I witnessed something on a U.S. submarine uh, that was unbelievable. And then, um, I worked for the Navy, actually. I got a business that does uh, special projects for them. And when I did a special project, I actually was went out on a submarine... And while on the submarine, uh, the sonar folks saw something come through the submarine's sonar at a high rate of speed. And what's high rate of speed? Several hundred knots. Several hundred knots. Now, that said, several hundred knots is, is very fast. And um, I uh, couldn't believe it. I I was seasick at the time that they made the, the, the announcement, uh, and I was sitting next to the guy who actually called the captain, or the con, the uh, the XO, actually the executive officer, to explain this, and the sonarman could not explain what he was seeing, and he's supposed to be able to explain everything, and he couldn't explain this, so uh, he just had his arms out like I don't know what to do, what do I do, and uh. The executive officer, when he heard the speed of several hundred knots and the, and the bearing and direction being something not threatening to the boat, he told a kid to log it and dog it, which to him meant just, okay, log it and then get rid of it. Move on, bury it. <laughs> so uh, I couldn't stand for that answer, and I walked up to the executive officer, and I said, Sir, um, I'm familiar with these objects. They uh, call them fast movers on the boat. Uh, and I said, I'm familiar with fast movers. Is there anything I can help you with, sir? And he goes, D'Antonio, right? I said, sir, yes, sir. He says, you having a good trip so far? Sir, yes, sir. He goes, let's keep it that way. And he walks away. Okay. <laughs> so a few years later, I had to do a job for the Joint Chiefs. And I was down in Washington delivering this project, this special project. And I asked one of the chiefs, I shouldn't have asked. I know I shouldn't have, but it was, the words were coming out of my mouth before my brain was able to stop them. And I said, what can you tell me about the the fast mover program, sir? And he looked at me and just smiled and said, I can't talk about that program, Mark. I'm sorry. And by the way, that was decades ago. Decades, plural. Okay. So now we had the Nimitz incident. Air Force pilots, the air wing on the carrier, saying that they've seen strange things they don't know what to do with. The congressional hearings with Ryan Graves, David Grush, and David Fravor, or, or you know, um, and <clears throat> and I can tell you this: um, Fravor's not lying. Graves isn't lying. The only one that could be lying is 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 um, is Grush. But a lot of what he says checks out too. All right, so interesting stuff. And so uh, all these aliens, all these extraterrestrial beings, where might they come from? They might be coming from a planet like this one. All right, this is why I'm, I'm mentioning all this, because a world like this, tidally locked, would probably generate uh, the, uh, a desire by its inhabitants to explore the universe. And if they're mostly on the dark side, then they would develop however they would develop maybe faster 
than we have. Maybe they had a better situation than we have. Um, Because as I mentioned way at the top, we're not a super habitable planet. We live here in spite of the planet and in spite of our sun. It's not the best star for this type of world. M stars are not the best either. But if they had a stable M star, then they might have actually been able to evolve very, very quickly. And because those planets are all close to their star, they probably didn't have uh, a lot of extinction level events. All right. So that's something that I think is pretty interesting. So it's possible that millions of years ago, other races have developed. And in the intervening billions of years, races have come and gone in our universe. And that said, um, I think that it makes a lot of sense to consider that many of the beings that might be visiting us could have come from planets sort of like ours, sort of like this one, uh, in the universe. And by the way, the star that planets like this are around, right, is is called an M star. And these M-type stars are the most plentiful type of star in the entire universe. And as such, these stars are... Um, almost all of them will have planets around them. In fact, when you saw the galaxies that we were looking at outside of our galaxy, when you saw all the many additional galaxies, up to 2 trillion galaxies that are actually modeled in this universe simulation, each of those galaxies will have, like I told you, between 100 billion and a trillion or more stars. Each galaxy of those two trillion. The numbers stagger the mind. And of those stars, the truth is, as we have discovered, there are more planets out there than the whole set of stars in the universe. So, you let that sink in over time. There's more planets than there are stars in the universe. And now you can see whether or not uh, the likelihood of life may, uh, may make itself known. Just by the sheer numbers alone, uh, and again, sheer numbers alone don't mean that it's guaranteed 100% that there's life elsewhere, but the likelihood is very high, very high, because we're not even a perfect planet with a perfect star. This planet's trying to kill us. In fact, it does. Okay, this star is trying to kill us, and in fact, it does. Many of you know people that have died of skin cancer. That's because of ultraviolet radiation from our sun that uh, ran away on their bodies and, and destroyed them before they could actually deal with it. Uh, I had some, too, that was removed. So the bottom line is that the ultraviolet energy from our sun is dangerous. Dangerous. You know? Now, uh... I saw a couple questions out there, um, and I saw from Michael Hedrick asking if Betelgeuse has any planets. Not that we know of. If it did, uh, they're certainly long dead. Um, Betelgeuse, where our sun would be, if you put it there, would go all the way out to the orbit of Jupiter. All right. So the entire inner star system would have been baked alive. Um, and the outer star system would have been uh, baked as well at this point. So if there's planets, we haven't seen any evidence of it. And then, uh, hey there, Marco. And then Trisha asked, what's your view or thoughts on Zeta Reticuli? Well, let's go see what my thoughts are on Zeta Reticuli. Let's see if it's in here. Yeah, it's... Um, I don't think it's in here. Let's see. I don't know it by that. Well, how about, uh, I can't do Z reticuli. Uh, no. If it's in here, uh, do you know the proper name of the star? I'm asking you, right? <laughs> I'd have to look that up um, to see if there's a proper name for the star. 
Because if there is, then that might be something we could look at. Um, let me see if I can find that, because you've got me curious now. If that star is modeled, because all the stars in our... Uh, all the stars in our, universe, in our galaxy are modeled with this that we know of. Zeta Reticuli... Uh, designation. I'm looking for other designations for it. Like also known as kinds of things. Um, okay, HD 20807. Let's see if that does it. HD... Two zero eight zero seven. Uh, let's see if the HD catalog is in here. It is. Let's see if two zero eight zero seven is in here. Ah, look at that! It is. We got it. I just had to look up the other uh, designation for it, Trisha. Well done. So let's go. We're gonna leave Trappist behind and go to Zeta Reticuli. Okay, Zeta Reticuli is a binary system. That is actually true. So, this is, uh, it's a G25, which is exactly what we are, and then a G35 uh, in this other, in this, uh, in this system is actually here as well. So, if we zoom out a little bit, all right. Oops, let me just do this. Let's zoom out. Okay, let's go out a little bit. It's what's called a wide binary. It's actually, uh, they're separated by uh, a long way. Now, if they're far enough away, then it's possible that there's planets around one or the other of the stars. And that's, that's, that's a possibility. So you see how far away that is? Yeah. That's interesting. What's that look like to you guys? That looks like the Pleiades to me. And it is. Okay. Remember, we're in our galaxy, so... And there is the Hyades. Okay, so Zeta Reticuli uh, has a widely spaced component. So it's entirely possible that this component or that component could have planets around it. There's there's no reason why not. Now, uh, if they if they show any planets, they would have to I'll be able to back that up. But Zeta Reticuli doesn't have any known planets, as far as we know. But this is the other one over here, and this is a slightly cooler star than ours. So we'll head there. <clears throat> Thanks for asking that question, Trisha. That was a good one. Yep. Yeah, so this again is, is exactly what we uh, would expect to see. You know? Excellent. So my opinion... There could be life there. There could be uh, planets. They're far enough away, well, uh, you know, away from each other. And you know, uh, I know Betty Hill's niece uh, very well. Um, and you know, so the star map. You know, I know that they try to match up the star map. You know, but look, Betty Hill's remembering that from memory, and so it could match any number of patterns, right? So it's hard to know, uh, but I do think it's pretty interesting. And when she said 
you know, zeta reticuli, that was actually very important because that tells you that she actually had some knowledge uh, that was imparted to her. And that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So I'm okay with that. That's pretty neat. So that's that's the star. Um, the other component, that's uh, Zeta 1 and the other one's Zeta 2. Now when I go out here, you notice that? That's the corona. Okay, that's the corona that it's trying to show the corona of the star. You block the bright disk and then the corona shows up. All right. And that's kind of what happens. And then you you employ filters to actually allow you to see uh, the actual shape of the star as you get closer. And pass it again. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, if you have any more requests out there, out there, please say them. That's pretty cool. I enjoy uh, doing that. All right. Meanwhile, uh, let's uh, let's do something else. Let's uh, there is another uh, another place we want to check out. Might as well while we're here, um, and it's the the Large Magellanic Cloud. The Large Magellanic Cloud is a companion galaxy to our own. And um, I'm not sure whether not sure whether I uh, buy the rendering of it as shown in here. Um, moving out past stars from another galaxy, then we come to this particular galaxy. Um, and in the past iterations of Space Engine, uh, the weird thing about this was, it showed as sort of like totally flat, like a, just a projected picture. And I thought, oh, it's doing the same thing. However, it's not. It's showing as something else. It's showing as a... It's showing as a... Uh, uh, Edge-on type galaxy. But I'm not sure this is correct, actually. I'm In fact, I'm, I don't buy this rendering of it at all. I think we would know... And there's certain nebulae in this in this uh, companion galaxy that we would know about and should know about. So I don't want to uh, I don't want to spend time here saying that this is exactly uh, the right thing because it really isn't. This is a real picture, but it's uh, it's it's not. This isn't accurate. But it's just the, I have that just to sh just want to show you anyway. All right, let's get out of there. Okay. All right. So there's our Milky Way again. Okay. Uh, uh, let's try this. Let's see if this is in here. Yeah. All right. I actually wanted to uh, do this last time, but I figure while we're here. Hey there, Mr. Django. How you doing, Steven? Now we're going to move into our solar system. We should see our sun go by. There it goes. And then we have the asteroid Apophis. Now the rumor is that this 1722 foot diameter asteroid is going to hit us in 2029. Well, um, not to be the purveyor of good news, but 
uh, to do so, it isn't going to hit us. Uh, we've actually been able to calculate its orbital elements and it's not going to hurt us. It's going to pass harmlessly by. But that's the asteroid Apophis. It's only, like I said, 1,722 feet across. It's not that bad. Michael Hedrick has, has more questions on fusion and fission and density density thresholds. Well, Jesus, that's that's a uh, there's a lot to that. Um, yeah. All right, hang on there, Mike. I'm gonna come down here now and. Now see, like if there's a space probe, this is what you'd see, right? The probe would be coming down here. It would be making its way down toward the surface of Apophis. You know? And it would actually end up landing on, on Apophis, I would think. Down it comes. And it lands where it lands. And then this is their view. On a 1722 foot diameter asteroid. Pretty cool. This is sort of like what happened with uh, the Osiris-Rex. Osiris-Rex uh, landed on the asteroid Bennu. And when it landed on Bennu, it actually stabbed Bennu with a little plunger device that sucked up a piece of the asteroid. And they actually brought it back to the Earth where it was dumped off by the passing probe re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and was retrieved and then the probe continued on to another asteroid. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. So we're getting pretty good. Now, um, the OSIRIS-REx mission to uh, asteroid Bennu uh, was uh, really pivotal. It was very important. And uh, I knew one of the scientists on the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous, Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous uh, team. And she was uh, a little white haired old lady, a real sweet person, and also happened to be a Catholic nun. <laughs> and she was a scientist. And I had her over the house one time with, with another nun that uh, you know because she was a nun the other nun's a family member and so this little white-haired old lady is sitting at my dining room table and i'm talking to her and she says oh you're into astronomy yes i am oh i love astronomy and i said oh cool you know have you seen pictures of the hubble oh no i'd love to see some of the hubble pictures so i went down to my printer and i printed off these beautiful color photos and i gave them to her and then i sat there at the dining room table and I proceeded to tell her what all these things were. You know, I talked about hydrogen and emission uh, and, and the uh, hydrogen alpha uh, transition. I talked about um, doubly ionized oxygen making this green, beautiful green line. And I talked about the difference between emission nebula and absorption nebula. I'm sorry, uh, emission spectrum and absorption spectrum. And... Um, and then we talked about emission lines in nebulae uh, versus absorption lines in nebulae. Um, and she was just sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the other nun starts laughing at me. And she finally loses and says, I can't take it anymore. I go, I'm sorry, what's, what's the matter? 
And she points at the other nun who's sitting here listening intently to me and says, she's an astrophysicist. I was like, what? I was like blown away. She was an astrophysicist. And she just sat there being so nice. And and she says, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the scientists on the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous team. Uh, and I successfully landed a probe on an asteroid, on the Eros asteroid. I went, you did that? And she went, yeah. <laughs> My gosh, I'm not worthy. I did that whole thing, you know. Oh, it was such an incredible thing. It was such a pleasure to meet her, and we became fast friends. Um, she passed some some years ago, but oh, I got to tell you, man, nothing beats uh, science. It really doesn't. You know, you get all your answers from science. You know, that was her name was Sister Mary Ellen Murphy, Mary Ellen Murphy. Uh, and just a, a, a sweetheart. So, when Osiris Rex went to the asteroid Bennu, uh, and I'm going to see if Bennu's in here. I don't know if it is. It is. Look at that. Excellent. Let's go to Bennu. Okay. Because I want to show you Bennu. Uh, not really. That doesn't really look like Bennu. It's just a... It's just sort of a... It's just sort of a rendering of Bennu. But, all right, it'll pass. So, when Osiris Rex went down to the surface of Bennu, and it landed on Bennu, um, that was, of course, a big mission. And the Osiris Rex team was calling for, uh, you know, tributes to people of importance in the field. And they said, we will put them on the Osiris Rex satellite, the Osiris Rex probe. And... So when Osiris Rex goes down to Bennu, it will take them with it. And then it will take them up into, uh, off to another asteroid later. And then finally, uh, around the sun for billions of years. And I said, I know exactly who you got to pay a tribute to. And I, I gave them all the information about Sister Mary Ellen Murphy. And uh, they took it and Mary Ellen Murphy has visited uh, Bennu and now she's visiting another asteroid and she will be on her way to uh, a long term orbit around the sun so I thought that was pretty cool so anyway uh, that's that's the Bennu story and the Osiris Rex story which I think is pretty neat I want to say hello to Prow, who's just joined us, and Cosmic Ray is here. Um, Asteroid 2008 OS7. Let's see if that's in here. I don't imagine it is, but you know what? We can find out. Uh, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, well. Nice try, I guess. Uh, the reason, by the way, that we're doing a cloudy night stream is because we have an atmospheric river out in Arizona that's uh, causing uh, lots of havoc with our sky out there right now. But not to worry. Not to worry. So if you cho if you choose to get this program, it's really really uh, cool. Uh, there is a free version out there as well as a paid version. Um, let's uh, get rid of that. And um, it's really neat. Now um, you can show the constellations, uh, so you can see like. And let's go into a quick mode here. So there's uh, Lyra. Now, what's happening is we're not at the Earth right now. Um, so if we just go back to Earth directly, um, in fact, we'll do that. It'll. It's pretty much. It's going to be pretty much the same. I just have to get us to the Earth, and we'll say go. And once we get there, there's Earth. Now when we look around, um, our constellations will be accurate. 
Okay, there's Leo the lion. Okay. And again, this is not a highly accurate imaging, right? So we can spin this around. Okay, there's the Big Dipper. Okay, what we can do though, this is Mizar, and Mizar is cool. We're gonna go there, because I'm gonna show you. We see Mizar in the handle, the middle star in the handle. Mizar's a double star, and we've often seen Alcor uh, together with Mizar. You can see him in the sky, we show them. Okay, so when we look at this, okay, uh, let me get rid of that. Okay. We have Mizar A and Mizar B. Uh, Mizar itself is a double, but then we have this star over here. This star is, uh, we have, a, we have a, we have Alcor. Okay. Let's, let's get this star here. Mizar B A. I mean, I bet you Alcor is actually farther out. I bet you that's what's going on here. Maybe. Let me turn off the constellations for now. Let me find Alcor. Yeah. So we'll go there. Okay, so this is the berry center. Now we're in, in between uh, Alcor. I see Alcor. Let me go back. This is the point of mutual uh, rotation around each other. This is Alcor A. Okay, Alcor. This is Alcor B, I believe. Yep. So Alcor is a star that is a double star to Mizar, and it is also itself a double star. And Mizar is a double star as well. So if we select Mizar A now here, okay, it's out here. All right. And it's a quarter of a light year away. And it's also a double. As you can see, it's got doubles. So many of these stars are double stars and more. And that's really interesting. And it's really kind of rare that stars are not doubles. Uh, the sun being a non-double star is actually kind of interesting. All right. So there's Mizar A. And this is Mizar B. Right. So, but from the Earth, what we see is Mizar and Alcor. Okay, there's Alcor and Mizar. So we see these two in the handle of the Big Dipper. What we don't see, though, is the fact that they're double doubles. You know, another interesting uh, set of stars that's like that as well is the Epsilon Lyra system. And I think I may have to I may have to get I'm going to probably have to uh, probably going to have to uh, look up the special name for Epsilon Lyra because I don't know if I could put in the Epsilon I'd get it but um, I don't know how to do that in here. Oh, well. I could look it up. Epsilon Lyra. Let's see what happens. So if you guys are liking this, this uh, trip through the galaxies and stuff, but that's pretty cool. Dan Longano, how are you? I see you've joined us. Thanks for finding us. We're actually hanging out looking. We're doing a cloudy night stream tonight, Dan, because we uh, 
We have clouds at the observatory. <clears throat> Normally we do live views of the universe, the universe live in real time. And uh, I can't uh, do it tonight because there is a major storm coming in. And so because we're a remote observatory, I'm 2,500 miles away from it, running it from Connecticut and it's out in Arizona in the desert. So sometimes we have to be careful. Uh, thanks, Cindy. Cindy, uh, did you ever get that journal that you had ordered from uh, Sky Tour Shop? I know there was an issue with it, and it showed that it got canceled. Um, and um, and I think you were only charged for the uh, the uh, the actual uh, the item that did get sent to you. But let me know. I saw a cosmic ray. Thanks. I'm doing it just just one thing at a time. Um, Epsilon Lyrae, I want to just see, uh, it's 162 light years away, and I'm going to find its number, HD173607, alright, let's try that, HD, uh, one, One seven three six zero seven. All right. One seven three six zero seven. Oops. HD. See, once you leave and come back. Oh. Well, did I get it wrong? No, I didn't. Well, let's try 17360. Well, anything. Nah. Well, I know it's in here. Uh, I'll just have to figure out where it is. Anyway, not able to see it tonight. I had these hypothetical planets around uh, these stars are generally just fabricated. Uh, but it is the real universe in front of us, which is really cool. Um... I'm going to do one other thing here while I'm at it. Let's do this. Let's go back to Earth. Let's go back home. <laughs> Here's our sun. Right. I figure while we're here, what we might want to do is, uh, in our solar system, we should explore our solar system. Now, I think it'd be kind of fun to go to uh, Jupiter uh, and do that, too. So let's go visit Jupiter, and then we'll visit uh, Mars and Pluto, check out Saturn. MBG says there's so much to see. Yeah, there is. So here's Jupiter. Now, what's interesting about Jupiter is that they actually uh, they actually have the uh, Juno data in it. Look, you can see that this is Juno data here. It's a little uh, and and the thing is. Is more of the proper color. That's the problem. That's the the problem and the blessing of Space Engine, is that they actually show it the way it's supposed to be shown. You know, it's the actual color. It's not that those uh, so vibrant colors that they're they're incredible because that's not what it really is. Yeah. If you look right there, you can imagine what that little guy is. There's Jupiter's ring. See it? It's very faint. There it is. Backlit by the sun. Only visible when Jupiter is not in the same frame. 
Shadow of Jupiter cutting it off. And then with this right here. Is that famous moon Io. There is so much science we learned about Io. I actually built a radio telescope uh, out of wood cross members and, and cable to listen to the uh, sodium ions that were around Io, and it was absolutely incredible. So Io is yellow because it's covered with sulfur, and the sulfur on Io is uh, rained down from these volcanoes on Io that are sulfur volcanoes. If you know anything about sulfur, you know that it melts at a very low temperature. And if you still, again, know about sulfur, you know that sulfur, when it melts, turns from yellow to blood red. And that's what happens with this stuff. So um, so it's really interesting to actually see it. I, uh, I've melted lots of sulfur in my day. Can you imagine a probe landing on Io? Probably land on a plane. <clears throat> it's probably near a sulfur volcano. Here we are on Io. And there is the view. And what a view it is. From on the surface of Io, this is what Jupiter would look like. Now, at this point, we would be getting bathed in uh, radiation belts that are 20 times more intense than our Van Allen radiation belts. So uh, that's something to consider. You know, but you also have to look at the fact that we're on Io. <laughs> You know, Jupiter's moon Io, this is pretty cool. So I'd be I'd be pretty pleased to be here. I would. I would think that this would be such a cool uh, moon to visit. And we'll just take off. Even little moons look big when you land on them. <clears throat> Here's an active volcanic vent over there. You can see with the uh, deep, deeper red. So Io's uh, got a, a mild atmosphere, believe it or not. Um, and there's sodium atoms in the atmosphere, there's sulfur, and during the, on the daylight side, like this side right now, um, the atmosphere is thicker and more plentiful, uh, but when it goes behind Jupiter and is, is transiting behind Jupiter and it's, it's dark in there, the atmosphere freezes out and falls back to the surface. And then Io is once again a completely atmosphereless, atmosphere-free uh, moon when it goes behind Jupiter. And then when it comes out again, those atoms become airborne again. And Io is no longer atmosphere-free. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So its atmosphere comes and goes, which is quite fascinating. 
And I really find that to be fascinating. So, neat. Now, another uh, place that we want to be, besides far away from here, um, the next location in the Jupiter system would be Europa, right? Because Europa is the place we think life might exist, underneath the ice. So Europa is the next moon out from Jupiter. We have Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And Europa has these large cracks in its surface uh, through which we're getting uh, strange, um, very strange uh, geysers and, and fluid. And when it seems to be uh, water vapor. It shows as water vapor, at least in the Hubble imagery. Uh, so I think it's really impressive. Uh, so what we're seeing on Io are cryovolcanoes, which are you know cold temperature volcanoes. Trisha Ferrer says, would there be earthquakes on Io since it has a volcano? Yeah, Io is actually among the most volcanic um, moons in the entire solar system, if not the most volcanic moon, right? But um, Io is actually uh, quite the uh, quite the active moon. It's resurfacing itself all the time, which is why you don't see a lot of craters on the surface of Io. Uh, and the craters you do see on the surface of Io, they're actually craters born of volcanic origin. You know. In Europa, we see some craters left over from the impact era, right? But again, it's also resurfacing itself. And that resurfacing is being done through um, the moving of the ice and the uh, geysers that are spitting out uh, ice crystals and water vapor. Absolutely incredible. The next of the Galilean moons would be uh, Ganymede. And uh, Ganymede is going to be up here. So we'll check out Ganymede as well and go to Ganymede. There's our... There's our Pleiades down there. By Jupiter we go. And Ganymede's dark. Why is that? Well, because it happens to be, as you'll see, right in transit with Jupiter right now. Okay. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. So let's bring this back a little bit. And what's realistic about this program is it shows that Ganymede appears to have an atmosphere. And it's actually true. Europa does too. and But the atmosphere is very thin. And it might be uh, a water vapor atmosphere which is really, really interesting because it means that uh, the water vapor is getting airborne off of the surface. But you can see Jupiter uh, is in, uh, is literally, and its ring, are you, not, you know, Ganymede is, is behind uh, Jupiter right now, so we're not seeing it lit up by the sun. But that's incredible. All right, so next on our list would be Callisto. If I could only just spell. Oh, here it is, Callisto. 
good. All right, and now Kalisto is going to be down here. I think I found a bug in the program. I don't think that this should be... Well, okay. There should not be... I think I saw the sun. And so there's, this should be lit up, but... Maybe not. Yeah, see? Okay, that's wrong. The the uh, the sun, this should be illuminated from this side. And it's not. Well, I'll submit that as a bug report. That's too bad. All right. And that's uh, where we're about to go. There's another uh, smaller one that everybody. Let's see here. Uh, Amalthea. Amalthea. Oh, maybe it's a M. Yeah, Amalthea. That's an asteroid around the sun. Um, but let's, I don't want to do that yet. I want to do, um, what I want to do is this. I want to take us now to Mars. I'll have to submit that Ganymede and Callisto's sun uh, was not properly managed. Okay. And now we're going to go zipping on to Mars, which is on the other side of the sun from us right now. And Jupiter. And here we go. If you've seen any of the data coming back from the Perseverance rover... You know that uh, we're making incredible strides now with that. And uh, we've actually been able to, uh, you know, with the helicopter, we've been able to just take these incredible jaunts on the Martian uh, surface. It's been incredible. Okay, this is interesting because... This is the wrong. It's the wrong data file. I have the high res data for this. And this is not the high res data. Okay, one second. Let me find out what's going on there. Yes, this is not the high-res Mars data. Yeah. Well, I will check that out. Um, the high-res data allows you to get right down the planet and sail through the canyons and stuff. And that's what I was uh, expecting to do here, so... <clears throat> this won't won't do it. This is not good. So I'm sorry about that. That's weird because it was fine before. I'll have to see what's going on. Anyway, I guess that means that when I go to Pluto, I'm going to also find that I don't have the high-res data for Pluto, do I? I don't know, I, I, I got to see, because I don't know where all that stuff went. Because Pluto and Charon are represented quite nicely. What the heck? Wow. Yeah, I don't have the, the data is missing. I don't know where it went. I had all this data downloaded uh, for these. 
So I, I don't know where it is. <clears throat> but I'll get it back. That's weird. I do want to try one more thing. Yeah, there it is. I want to see if they got Ultima Thule right. Ultima Thule is a pancake, two pancakes, binary asteroid, contact binary. Okay, we're getting there, traveling. Counting down the seconds. Yeah, all right, well, they got Ultima Thule right. Remember New Horizons? The New Horizons spacecraft went to Ultima Thule after Pluto. And this is really interesting. This digital model was created from the Ultima Thule flyby. Just think how cold it is out there. Wow. And here's a shot you don't see every day. Oh, that's amazing. It's not flat on the bottom, it's just there's no sun there. That's really pretty. Now, that's interesting because Ultima Thule was not in here last time I checked, and now it is. So that's actually a nice uh, addition. If you want a cool song, download New Horizons, uh, done by Brian May. Brian May, of course, artist in Queen, also um, an astrophysicist, <laughs> amazingly enough. So there we go. I will get the uh, these high-res uh, imagery back in. I don't know where it went. That's the old stuff. I don't have the old stuff in here. I got all the new stuff. But at this point, we are about as far out as at this point than we than humans have ever been. So that's pretty cool. So and how long would it take us to get to Earth? from here well earth is 42.32 au from here and it's over there by that red that that orangey thing known as the sun yep fast now it took us 15 years to get to Pluto but as you can see that didn't take long oh now look at this well I'm sorry guys it seems like I've killed all life on earth interesting for whatever reason the 
textures have popped out on me. That's strange. Well, not a big deal. And I'll tell you why. Because I was thinking I was going to be ending the stream anyway, but um, I just didn't expect it to go that way. I thought I would actually just be able to make it a nice ending. So I'll have to uh, let them know that something happened here. I see that going on. So it looks like it's trying to load. Ooh. wonder if it's doing what I think it's doing. It's not doing any paging. I've got plenty of disk space. All right. There might be a memory leak. Anyway. Hey, Vince Giglio. How you doing? Fantasy, how you doing? Okay, Mr. Django is off to work. Thank you for coming by. Why? That's a strange looking world. Well, now I understand. So it's actually not... Uh, it's not... It's not me. It's the program doing some weird things. <laughs> well, that's understandable. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, try to start it again and see what happens. Why not? So it should, if it starts up, then we can actually at least check out Pluto, right? Gotta check out Pluto and Mars. <clears throat> So we should be facing Earth when we come back in. Program is starting back up now. Okay, there's our planet, Earth. All right. And now, I'm gonna start by going to uh, Pluto, like I said, first. Let's go there. <clears throat> There's Pluto way out there. It doesn't take us 15 years to get here. Seven, six, five, four. Ah, that's more like it. See, that's the Pluto we expect to see. This is actually real. We don't know what this part looks like because we only imaged it roughly like this on the way on the way out of the system. So we just got a passing view of it with New Horizons here. I actually have the curated geologic USGS data for this. And I've printed sections of Pluto in 3D print on our SLA machine. It's just beautiful. It's crazy beautiful. Um, now Pluto is a two. Uh, a two planet system but it has a number of other moons okay it has Charon okay which when I say it's a two planet system meaning the second one is massive like not, not as massive as Pluto but it's big and then we have um, and then we also have Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra which are smaller moons of Pluto and you'll see that's why I say Basically, it's a two-planet, two-body uh, system, I guess you'd say, because these others are really small. Okay, that's behind the planet, and then Hydra is right there. Okay, but if we look at Charon, okay, right, look at Charon, okay, You'll see these, uh, you'll see what's interesting about these moons and the, these two moons, I'm sorry, this moon and this planet. And that is that one of the poles or one of the areas on Charon that is interesting to look at has actually been covered with the same material that's on Pluto. 
And it's strange when you say, well, wait a minute, why is one side of Sharon got this brown cast to it? And the answer is because Sharon is so close to Pluto that material from Pluto, uh, through uh, impacts and other processes, has left Pluto and landed on Sharon, which is really interesting. Okay, so that's why Sharon has this brown segment you see right here. Check that out. So that's what's going on with Sharon. Now Pluto itself, all right, see how far away they are? That's close. So if we go back to uh, Pluto now, All right, and let's go and go to where we know, let's go to Sputnik Planitia, which is this area right here on Pluto. This is what we know of Pluto. This is the area that uh, we've seen. Uh, let's center it up. Here we go. Okay. So we know this well. I did a... Uh, Oh, what on earth episode um, where there were these objects that were visible on the surface of Sputnik Planitia and they wanted to know what they were because they, they, they said they look like giant snails on the surface and I get that you know I could see what they're talking about but what's going on really as I told them is that well, the surface is actually nitrogen ices, and uh, what's happening is the water ice uh, beneath is squeezing up through the cracks. Okay, and contrary to what the conspiracy folks are saying, that these are snail trails, these are actually uh, convection cracks in the surface of Pluto. So when we look at these things, these things are not creatures of any kind. They're actually upwellings of water ice pushing through the nitrogen ice surrounding it, which is a very interesting uh, finding. So that's what is going on at Pluto. And then Pluto's mountains are so high, once you get off of Sputnik Planitia, uh, and the reason is because of the fact that Pluto's gravity is so low. So we can get really high mountains on Pluto. And you'll notice the blue haze you're seeing now. Pluto has an atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a water vapor uh, atmosphere. Which is fascinating that Pluto actually has an atmosphere. Uh, now it's not a big one, it's a trace atmosphere. But it's there. Something that we never expected. Never expected to see that. But look at as we back away. We'll get to a point where if we actually can go into silhouette here. Okay, come around this side. And you see the blue atmosphere of Pluto. And we'll just drop down a little more. And there it is. This is actually quite accurately portrayed. Really, really nice. And as we get closer, What's fun is, um, as we get closer, okay, you can recreate the photos that were captured on the way out. It was like this photo, there was a photo like this that was taken on the way out that shows uh, a tremendous, uh, beautiful landscape with the blue atmosphere of Pluto. It was there. 
pretty neat. Now let's try Europa again while we're at it. Because I think Europa's map was wrong. <clears throat> I think what happened was uh, the memory was being eaten up as it had a memory leak. Because Europa's map is. Uh, that didn't look like Europa to me. Still doesn't look like Europa. Uh, where's all my little trails and so forth? I don't see them. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try one last thing. Let's go to Saturn. Saturn's further away. So it's taking us some time to get there. Ah, but here we are. This is beautiful. And, you know, Saturn has also got some interesting stuff of its own. It's got little moons, shepherd moons in the rings, which are neat. Okay. It has the closest thing to a primordial Earth that we've seen, which is the moon Titan, right? And uh, let's try this, because I think you got to move slow. But you can actually go down into the rings. Let's try this. Because the, the rings are made of small particles of ice. And if we're very ginger with going in here, we can actually... We can actually go down into the rings and see all the ice particles. Just be really careful about it. Now, one thing about these rings is interesting with Saturn is that Saturn's rings are evaporating. Um, they're going to be uh, crashing into the planet little by little, you know, at the inside edges. Um, and so that's going to be the ultimate fate of the rings. Oh, we just saw particles. <laughs> okay, we're going to come up slow here. Okay, we're going to slow down even more. Well, I can't get it. I'm not gonna waste your time. Um, but it, 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 if you saw a little bit of it, you gotta be very careful because it's actually a very thin cross section. But this inner part, these rings are raining down into the planet's atmosphere a little by little, which is kind of, you know, sad and unfortunate, but that's what happens. Let's see if we can do this. Do it the hard way. <laughs> Let's do it this way.
night. I'm not moving, but you'll notice the rings seem to be. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that the planet's rotating. And there are those ice particles. See, just because I'm not moving doesn't mean the planet's not moving, because it is. There we go. So, accurately rendered, which is really kind of cool, actually, very nice. And then up out of the rings. Really impressive the way the uh, the ring shadows are placed on the planet. And you can actually see that in the telescope. <coughs> in the uh, telescope we're getting for the observatory, the next one, uh, you'll be able to see all of that quite easily. Very cool. All right. So leaving behind the world of tremendous rings and things, here's the constellation of Orion out there. There is Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, and Safe. Then we have Alnatak, Amalam, and Mintaka. And then Orion's sword we have down here. We have the Orion Nebula, the pink thing right there. That's actually how it looks at our all sky cam now. And the Orion's, you know, Orion Nebula is that pink in it, so it looks really good. Next, we're going to go back to Mars because I know that I know that you're just dying to see Mars. Maybe not. Maybe just saying, when's it going to be over? Let's go to Mars. All right. <laughs> I guess we uh, we broke the uh, graphics again. <laughs> uh. I wonder if it was Europa that did that to us. All right. Another time. Another time. That's too bad. Because now Earth is going to be broken too, huh? Stars aren't. Mercury or Venus. The moon. And, of course, our blue ball. Okay. All right, well, obviously, that wasn't the intention. Um, not sure what happened there. But, oh, well, I hope you guys uh, have a good night. I'm probably going to call it now because I, I just have to, I'd hate, I'd have to quit this again. It seems to be a memory leak in the program. Uh, I didn't write it, but if I did, uh, it would make me nuts until I figured out what went wrong. But we got to see some cool stuff. Uh, and gener we visited the local group of galaxies, checked out all of our um, uh, planets little by little, as best we could. And then uh, took a tour of some of the other fascinating features of other galaxies out there. So I hope this was cool. Um, I look forward to uh, doing a uh, sky tour with the telescope the next time it'll be clear and uh, again in later on in February I'll be installing that all sky cam out there that I built here it's performing flawlessly and I'm looking real forward to showing more of it to you so for now I'll say good night and thank you for joining me and it was a nice cloudy night stream visiting our universe so remember when you're outside don't forget keep looking up all right it 
except while you're driving, as Amanda Curran used to say, who was our original SkyTour livestream co-host. Good night, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>